And uh, of course, before you even start writing, you could say, yeah, we're going to write the article. If you write the article, that, that's, that's fine. What happens is you decide you're going to write the manuscript and then look for a suitable journal. And you've written the manuscript, and it looks pretty good. And then you go through all this idea of picking the right journal, and you select you and your co-authors the right journal for you, and you find that it's actually, they have a, a word limit. And you check what you've written, and it's... 30% more. Oops. Far better to pick the journal first before you start writing and then base your manuscript writing around what that journal wants and needs and, and, and demands. So to be get the best journal, you've got to think of the reader's needs, not the author's needs. You're the author. Okay. Fine. You want to publish. But if the reader is much more important. The reader needs to get information, they can get it from everywhere, and you'd rather they got it from you. So how can you give them what they need to have in a way that they want it? That's the challenge that successful writers achieve, and unsuccessful ones don't. So you've got to pick a good journal to start with. You might say, oh yes, I'll go for nature, I'll go for science. Yes, yeah, sure, fine. Uh, very, very low levels of uh, acceptance and very, very hostile peer review. It's possible. If you've got great articles, you can do that. But otherwise, just see the, the best you can do based on all sorts of criteria. The most important one is where would readers in your field expect to find scientific articles? Is it going to be in a certain journal which you like or a journal which they normally expect to find them? If there's a difference, you should go to where they like. Everyone has, has a comfort zone of journals. If you do a, a whole search, you find a list of articles and journals. If the journals are what you expect in your field, you're comfortable, you're happy to read them. If it's outside of your field, you'll still read the article based on the title and abstract, but you don't have the same comfort feeling. You've actually got to somehow uh, evaluate it differently. So if you can somehow get your journal in the comfort zone of the readers, they're much more likely to accept it and read it. So firstly, you're thinking, OK, where would they, where's the best place to publish? Great. But where are you going to publish? There's lots of choices, say, thousands and thousands of journals. And there's all sorts of various tools and options you can do. But firstly, you and your co-authors have got to come up with a bunch of potential journals. They're called candidate journals. Four, five, three, whatever. Let's say pay four. And so you're coming up with a bunch of journals initially from scores, dozens of journals, to filter it right down. So you look at where, which journals you're going to be citing, which articles are you citing. If there's a whole bunch of articles you're going to be citing from one journal, perhaps that journal is suitable as a potential candidate journal. It could be one of the co-authors that said, that's a great journal, I've published it in the past, and they're very helpful, very good peer review, very fast. <coughs> so that's a, perhaps another reason to put them on the candidate list. The candidate journal list. And so, uh, also you've got to ask yourself some other questions, like, is the journal peer reviewed to the right level? Some of them, are, as I said, like um, nature, science, very, very strong peer review, hostile peer review, uh, very, very low uh, accept rate, 1% or so. Um, and some are almost no peer review, some almost uh, nothing, just, just a few words, if that. You want the middle ground. You want helpful comments from scientists who are your peers that make your paper better. Let's face it, as, as an author, we don't really like peer review, but we know it helps. And everyone says, I don't like peer review. Right. But are the suggestions that the review is helpful? <laughs> yes. Does it make your paper better at the end? Yes. Will it get more downloads and citations? Yes. Okay. And they don't even ask for their name to be on the co-author list. It's also good. It's anonymous. Great. So we recognise that peer review is necessary, but at the same time, you've got good, strong peer review. gives you good information, helpful to you. How about the journal's audience? The second point here. Journal's audience, who will read your article? Can you tell? Do people put their hands up and say, oh, I read that journal? Of course not. So you've got to see, are there articles in that journal on the same topic as you, on your topic area? If they are, great. 
if you've only got, say, 5% of the articles in your topic area, the rest of 95% are not, try and have one with a, a, quite a large chunk of your topic area in, in that journal. And that's what we're looking for. How, and that's a potential audience. A, you know, writer equals reader, basically. How fast is a journal? Does it matter how fast a journal is? Yeah. Uh, in a perfect world, you're the only person in the world researching this. All the time in the world, you can just take your time, send it to some nice, happy journal, which is very nice and good and laid back, and eventually comes back to you with the results, and eventually it goes online. The whole thing can take eight, nine, ten months. Which is fine, but we haven't got the time. So you want to have a pretty fast peer review and pretty fast up there online. Firstly, you can't cite your paper till it's published, so you can't use it in future job applications or funding applications or moving position or anything else. Um, and also, the sooner you're up there, the sooner you've captured that intellectual property space, not someone else. This competitive ele element we have in publishing. Do journals tell you how fast they are? No. Sorry. Some do, some don't. Most don't. I apologise. Even elsewhere journals don't say all of them. So what you do is you have your candidate journal list. You go look online at what they've published. You look at the, copy, the cover date of that particular volume. You look at some articles in there. When were they submitted? When were they revised? When were they accepted? OK, when was it published? That gives you the particular so-called production window that tells you how long it's taken from start to, fit to finish, which is fine. Do not pick things like review articles or special issues, but regular, ordinary articles. And then if you do that for three or four articles of each journal, you get an idea for the actual processing time per journal. I think you'll be surprised and perhaps horrified how slow some journals are. Some could be pretty fast, six weeks, seven weeks from start to finish, which is really, really fast. Um, others could be, say, 10 months. For my journals in applied biochemistry, if the whole process takes longer than 13 weeks average, I get upset because my viewpoint is it should be less than that. Uh, and so therefore, I urge the editors to be a bit more uh, tough on the referees to come back with their decisions quicker to make sure it can be in that time process. Impact metrics. What's impact metrics? That's things like uh, the site score, the impact factor, the SNP, uh, other similar things, H-index. Uh, it's useful. Uh, at the same time, it's not the be-all and end-all. It's a useful extra component in that multi-analysis of each candidate journal. And of course, if you do need to or want to publish open access, that's an extra step. Because of the journals out there, a good 80% are actually not open access. And so if you are determined to publish open access, that cuts out a whole bunch. And so again, all these various aspects colour your list of candidate journals. And of course, if you are going to publish open access, make sure the journal is real. And it does actually exist. There are a few fake ones. Well, there are many fake journals out there, sadly. Uh, and so therefore, you don't want to send to a fake journal. That's just a waste of your time. If you come across a journal you think it's, it might be fake, there are various lists out there online. And you can see if the journal is potentially predatory, open access. Then cross it out of your list and move on. And you're coming down with a list of these so-called four or five candidate journals. And also, you've got to think about the aims and scope of the journal. Is it really uh, is what you're going to be writing actually in scope for what you've got um, going to be published appropriately? Um, are you going to be writing a long article and that journal only has short articles or vice versa? So again, just, just see, what, see what they want, see what they need. OK, bibliometrics, as I said, you have things like the, uh, the site score, the impact factor and so on. This arrow is each side for a simple reason. There's so many different uh, bibliometrics. If you're really interested, you go look at Wikipedia bibliometrics. There are pages of information there. Um, and it, it, it's, it's interesting. Everyone thinks about the impact factor. Uh, impact factor is historically the most interesting. It's the oldest one. It was designed for librarians to make it easier for librarians to, to judge the potential quality of the average articles published in a particular journal. So then you've got, you think, the right sort of audience, maybe. You've got the right people. You know where it's going to be. You know who the audience are. Perhaps your university library might be helpful here. Perhaps some of your colleagues who published a lot might be helpful. Um, this little box here is interesting. Uh, we've just 
revamped our uh, journal finder tool. Uh, in the past, it wasn't particularly wonderful. Now, by, by throwing a lot of uh, technology money at it using AI, we got a, a better system. You put the abstract into this journal finder, and it comes up with suggestions for Elsevier journals. Of course, uh, there are many journals out there, apart from Elsevier journals, but at the same time, it's a good start. It might put you on a certain track uh, to go into uh, a different way you, you thought of. So then you and your co-authors have got, say, four or five potential journals in your candidate list. Then you and your co-authors, your co-researchers, have got to agree the sequence. Because you're not going to submit to all of them at once. If you submit to all at once, it's called parallel submission. It's unethical and actually can be penalised. You can be banned from publishing for a couple of years if you do that. So what you've got to do is you've got to then say, OK, co-authors, what's journal A? What do we all agree is journal A? Okay. If we're not good enough for journal A, what's going to be journal B? Okay. What happens if we're really out of luck? What's the next one? Journal C. So you've got this cascade, in effect. So journal A, everyone agrees journal A is the one to go for. Okay. Great. Then all the co-authors agree it's journal A and journal B. We all agree this is the sequence we're going to do. Then you look at the guide to authors of journal A before you start writing. That's the point you find out they actually have a word limit and you're lucky you read it then, not after you started writing the manuscript. The guide to authors' job is to help the authors write their papers in a clear way so that people can better um, present their papers so it's easier for the editor and referees to understand and evaluate. So the guide to authors helps authors write papers so the editor can evaluate them better. That's the process. Some people are pretty laid back. Some editors are laid back about uh, uh, the real details of the guide to authors. And some editors are really, really, really strict. Their viewpoint is their personal text. Why are there so many guides to authors? Because there's so many different journals. Each journal has a slightly different text in there. As a publishing house, we'd love to have all guide to authors the same, but we can't because it's the helping the peer review process. The editors choose the text. If they really, really have worked on that text and you don't follow it, some of them feel it's a sign of disrespect that you've antagonised them already. So if they're really laid back about things, then, then it might be who you haven't. Do you know who is easily antagonised, who's not? No, you don't. So assume the worst. Assume that everyone wants you to use the guide to authors exactly as they've stated it, because that's the best way to uh, get your better chance of going out for peer review. The guide to authors, it looks different in journal to journal. It happens to be a hypertext layout. And you can download, say, an author information pack as a, a PDF. If you do that, that's fine. But if you downloaded it more than three or four months ago, I suggest you check the online version because it changes small bits here and there all the time. You don't want to be caught out by a change of guide to authors. Here's one guy. Uh, called Paul Haddad, editor journal of chromatography A. Now, J. Crom A is all about the, the physical aspects of chromatography. J. Crom B is about the biological aspects of chromatography. So a very clear division. But some people out there think, oh, obviously journal A is better than journal B, so I'll send my, my biological stuff to journal A, which he hates because he's not a biologist, doesn't want the squidgy stuff. He wants to have <laughs> the chemical stuff. And so what he says, in fact, you ask any editor the same, same story, these are the problems appear too frequently. Papers are out of scope. They haven't bothered to read the scope. The guide to authors has been ignored. Uh, the suggestion that reviewers are not used, um, or uh, they suggest inappropriate ones, people you've worked with before or whatever. The English quality of writing is so poor, you can't understand what's going on. And people have had manuscripts rejected, and they just sent them into the next journal without changing them around. And that's not good either, because it just, it's, a, it's a waste, because it's easily found out. And that just the whole process of this peer review is to make your article better. You're not trying to game the system and cheat to get in. So another editor of mine, this one is, editor of Protein Expression Purification, says, basically, I'm not going to 
waste my time on papers that are badly written. I refuse to spend my time trying to understand what the author's trying to say. And also, he says, as a rule of thumb, if there's more than six grammatical errors in the abstract, it's a death reject. That's heavy, but that's the reality. And don't, don't blame me, I'm just sharing what editors have sent to me. So you might think, well, I was planning on polishing the paper during the revised version. You won't get the chance because we're in no revised version. It'll be a desk reject. So always send in your article as if it is the best final version will be out there forever. Because once it's published, it's in a scientific record forever. So therefore, always make sure it's as best as it can be. When you're writing, you've got this idea of scientific language. If you're English first language, you're not taught scientific language writing. If you're English second language, you're not taught that either. You're taught English literature, which means writing in a certain style. And typically the sentences are 50% longer. Now for scientific language, short, snappy sentences. It's one of those things. But no one talks, talks to you about this. Short sentences, the correct tense. A scientific paper has to laid out in a certain way. The introduction typically is past tense and present tense, and explaining the problem and situation. Your method you describe in the past tense, and the results you found past tense. Your discussion of them is present tense, and then the conclusions and applications, of course, are present tense and future tense. And that gives a subconscious signal to the reader to get more data extraction from your article by getting the tenses right. But no one tells you this until today. The grammar has to be accurate clear. If you're English first language, you tend to write about 10% too much. If you're English second language, you write 10% too little. So it's a question of prepositions and adjectives and so on. And of course, you might be bilingual or trilingual, but you're only writing in one language. If you happen to be studying something where you are publishing in your own, own language, for example, law or literature or poetry or something, or, or, or local um, economics, whatever it is, Fine, but just that one language. The rest of the world, we're publishing in English because that's the international language of science currently. Uh, 50 years ago, it was different. 50 years ago, you could publish in English, French, German, or Russian, as long as you had four abstracts in four languages at the beginning of the paper. <coughs> Journals that were launched at that time, 50 years ago, the titles were often in Latin because they didn't know if the final language was going to be English or German. In the end, it became English. It was just about English or German 50 years ago. That's why there are many Latin titled <coughs> journals. I have um, one of those journals myself as one of my journals I look after. So, so yes, it's 50 years ago, those four languages. Now, English. 50 years' time, maybe Chinese. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Currently, English. Currently, English. What sort of English? Well, you've got to ask yourself, what does the journal say? There's the guide to authors. What does the guide to authors say? Have a look. It might say you can use British spelling or American spelling, but not a mixture. That's the normal way they phrase it. Some journals actually are very, very clear. They say you must use British spelling. Some say you must use American spelling. Normally, they're small society journals which um, have that, that viewpoint. Um, but in general, it's one or the other. So make sure you and your co-authors all use the same spell checker. And then you can say, I have a choice. Should I use British English or should I use American English? Tough one, huh? Any ideas in the audience which is better to use if you don't care one way or the other? American spelling or British spelling? Depends on the journal. It does. If it's a British journal uh, and all the, uh, as they say, you could use either, and it's a British editor in chief and British editors, you might be idea to use British. But see what has been published. But in fact, in general, it's American. If you look at a, a word, a scientific word that can be spelled both ways in something like Google Scholar, you'll find the ratio about seven to one of American spelling to British spelling. So basically, the British lost. We lost the war. The war of language. Um, so what happens is that people out there, North America, South America, are used to American spelling. Half of Asia, American spelling. Most of Africa, 
American spelling, half of Europe American spelling. So that's why you have this ratio of 7 to 1. So if you're not really sure, think of the reader who's American spelling. Unless, of course, you looked at some of the papers and see that very, most of them are in British spelling because the editorial structure is British. So again, it's a people game. Understand what's going on, though. You want to lower the threshold of unfamiliar, unfamiliarity to the reader by making the spelling right. So why do they spell colour that way? Or why is it an S or a Z or whatever? You know? So that's the thing you've got to think about, of what's <coughs> best for the reader. And uh, so if you have very strong feelings, fine. But my viewpoint is that I nowadays tend to write in American spelling when I'm sending out things out there, despite being, as you can tell from my accent, British. Uh, one of those things, it's just accepting the reality that we lost. Uh, so, <laughs> you've got to be realistic here. Uh, so, in terms of scientific languages, sentences, short, direct sentences, short, snappy sentences. If you're not sure if a sentence is too long, try reading it out loud. If you stop to pause for breath partway through, it's too long. Simple guide. Of course, if you read the whole thing through, yeah. Some cultures, for example, Spanish, Italian, if you can be clever and run on the whole thing as a whole paragraph, <laughs> that's wonderful literature. Not in science. In science, short, snappy sentences. Sorry, that's how it goes. Because if you try to, to run, read that out loud without an Italian sentence or a Spanish sentence, uh, without pausing for breath, you, you fall on the floor. We know that. Uh, so short, snappy sentences. It's just, it's just short, short, short. 